Good morning. Good morning. Is everyone enjoying this fall weather as much as I am? Isn't this great? You can step outside and the heat doesn't hit you as soon as you walk out the door. I actually stood out in the back porch this morning and just enjoyed the cool. Uh, my name is Ed Miller. I've been here before. You may not remember, but I've, uh, I'm a friend of Steve's from Singmen of Texas. Um, he is down in the valley. We need to be praying for him as he and the country boys are ministering down there. Uh, I recently retired from full-time ministry, music ministry, but I now am a licensed counselor at the Hope Center here in Corsicana. And, and first and foremost, I need to thank First Baptist Church for what you guys brought to the Hope Center last month. Uh, our staff watched in amazement as you guys just kept bringing in load after load after load. Uh, Brother Danny was in the bus, just kept uh, handing things out of there. It was like, kind of like it just was going to never end as the, you guys just kept bringing things. And I know, I think it was Michelle who headed that up, uh, and I don't know if she's in this service, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Are you back there, Michelle? I, I didn't see you come in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as you know, we survive on your donations, and what you gave us will last us about until about 2030. Uh, so, no, I jest. We have baby store this week, and, you, and what you gave us will help us supply this month's baby store. Uh, I will tell you that we're having a community-wide garage sale this coming weekend, uh, so if you have anything you want to get rid of, that'll just help us even more support the work of the Hope Center. And I love the work of the Hope Center, so forgive me for that unashamed uh, plug for, for what we do down on the other side of town. But we are here to spread the word that Jesus saves. So let's stand together if you're able and sing, Jesus saves.
And all God's people said today, Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads together and let's pray as God's people. Almighty Lord, our weeks are busy and we have so many things that are going on and so many tasks, Lord, to try to complete. Lord, we have to-do lists and they push us and, and Father, we feel stressed, but we're so thankful that we can come and we can enter into this place and we can have sanctuary. God, that we can breathe in rather than always breathing out, that we can receive from you. Lord, that which we need. God, that we can turn our hearts towards heaven and just praise you as our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer. Lord, the one who loves with a love that we so desperately need and sometimes we can't even understand. But God, we thank you for your amazing eternal love. We thank you for grace that flows to us. God, we're failures most of the time. But God, your mercy covers us and you never turn on us. Lord, you don't act like we do. Lord, you're faithful, and we love you for that. We love you that you take us where we are, and you take us where you want us to be. Lord, we're thankful that we can put our lives in your hands, that we can trust you. God, we're thankful that we have a testimony to share with every person that we know that you are the one who left the glory of heaven, that you gave your life as sacrifice, Lord, you died upon a cruel cross to take our place, but Lord, then you rose again and you gave us life even in death. Jesus, we praise you today. We worship you. We glorify you. We give everything that we know about ourselves to everything we know about you. Lord, we, we surrender ourselves to you today. So we thank you that we can come together. We're thankful that you're in this place, that your spirit is here with us today. Lord, fill our hearts our cups to full and overflowing today. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Be seated, church family. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And I agree with Brother Ed, the weather is some kind of wonderful, and uh, we've survived to get to this point, and we relish uh, these few days that we'll have semblance of fall. And, um, and we're thankful for them. If you're our guest today, I just want to extend a welcome to you. Uh, thank you for being with us. Many of you are church members, but a few of you are guests, and I just want you to know that your presence here is, is much appreciated. We love you, and uh, we want you to come be a part of this forever family. And I ask you to get on your phone, go to fbccana.org, and you can check in and let us know about yourself that way, or just look into that pew pocket in front of you, and you'll find a card there where you can tell us about yourself. Also, you can turn it over and give us prayer requests. Just drop that card in the giving receptacle on the landing when you're done. Uh, let me also make, make mention of this. Look in that pew pocket right quick and find a card. Just pull it out so I can make sure that you know what I'm referring to. It says ministry team or bus ministry. Uh, many of you are always looking for places to serve, and many have come to me in recent days and said, Pastor, I really love being part of the church, but I don't feel like I'm ministering in the church, and I want to be a deeper part. Um, I want a bus ministry to develop finally and fully at First Baptist Church. We have skated around the edge of this for years, but let me tell you how simple this is. All we need are people with driver's licenses to say, I will drive the bus, not the big one, the little ones, all right? It's just a glorified suburban. It's no big deal, all right? We need you to drive it for us to go pick up people who would not come to church or be able to come to church otherwise. Uh, there are stories all throughout history. I'll bet you there's some in this room of people that were brought to church in a bus ministry, and as a result, they gave their life to Jesus Christ. So if you want to see people saved, go pick them up in a bus, right? It's that easy. And so, so some of you could do this. Uh, you and your wife could get on there every single Sunday morning and you could drive out and pick up people who call in and say, hey, I would like a ride. Uh, we're trying to develop our college ministry right now. All we really need are people to drive out to the college and pick those kids up. Uh, you couldn't ask for an easier role in the church than to just come and drive the bus. So if you would, if God's speaking to your heart and you say, you know, that's something I certainly can do, take this card, give us your name and your phone number on the back, say yes, 
put it in the giving receptacle, and we'll put you on that ministry team. You're going to be in a rotation. That's our goal. You're probably not going to have to drive every single Sunday, okay? And But you'll be in a rotation, and you'll be a part of that, developing that for First Baptist Church. So thank you for letting me plug that today, and I hope many of you will be a part in the near future. Thank you for being in church today. Now the choir is going to sing a beautiful song for us.
up my eyes to the Lord because His strength is perfect. There is no other that's perfect. Let's lift our eyes and our strength to the Lord. His strength is perfect when our strength Oh! 
God bless you, Ed, and thank you so much for leading us. I want us to join together and express our appreciation to our brother Ed Miller for leading us in worship today. Appreciate him being here so very much. Also, before I say anything else, I want to offer my personal appreciation to Mike and Cindy McCary. Um, they lovingly have placed these flowers today in honor of Pastor Appreciation Month, and it's a great encouragement to me. So, Cindy, thank you to you, and I, I guess Mike is out doing safety team duty, and so we appreciate that very much. Well, good morning again to you. I'm so glad that you're in worship today, and I'm extremely excited that we have the privilege of being able able to continue in our sermon series on the Gospel of Mark. If you have not been with us, we've titled this series, The Remarkable Life of Jesus. And Mark is an incredible book. It tells us about the life of Christ, the actions that he took, the many things that he did. And today is the seventh sermon in this series. And let me say this, if you haven't been with us, um, it's not too late to go back and watch those previous six. You can go online to our church's website, Facebook, YouTube, any of those options, and you can get caught up to speed as we have begun to study this incredible account of the life of Christ given to us by the Apostle Peter. Now, the title of today's message is How to Faith the Storms of Life. Now, that's not a typo, and yes, you heard it absolutely right. I didn't say how to face, but how to faith the storms of life. And we all face storms, but this sermon is different than that. We're really talking about our ability to faith the storms that come to us in this life. And to get us to thinking in the right way, I want us to start thinking about how hard it would be to be a weather forecaster. You know, I've said for many years, it's the only job that you can be wrong pretty much 90% of the time, and you just keep your job, and nobody says anything negatively about you. And so it would be one of the hardest jobs there is to be a weather forecaster. So I've got a story to go along with that as we begin. There was a Native American chief on this remote reservation in South Dakota, and his tribe had come to him and asked him if it was going to be a cold winter. Well, he did not want them to know that he could not predict the weather, so he sneaked off and he called the National Weather Service. And he asked them, hey, is this going to be a cold winter? And they said, sir, we are fairly certain it's going to be a cold winter. So the chief goes back to his tribe and he tells them to start collecting firewood because it was going to be a cold winter. Well, a few weeks later, he began to doubt the forecast, so he goes back and he calls the forecaster again, and this time the forecaster says this. He says, we are now more certain than ever that it's going to be a very cold winter. So the chief goes back to his tribe, and he tells the tribe to collect even more firewood. Well, a few weeks later, yes, the chief once again is doubting the forecast, so he calls the forecaster one last time to update the forecast, and the forecaster says, we are now certain that this will be one of the coldest winters we've ever had. And the chief says, how can you be so sure? And he said, well, the Indians are collecting firewood like crazy. <laughs> and so it is, right? Today we're going to be talking about a storm that comes to the disciples of Jesus Christ as they plan to cross the Sea of Galilee. Now, let me tell you a couple details about the Sea of Galilee. Several of us in the room have had the privilege to actually sail on a boat there on the Sea of Galilee. But here's what you need to know. The Sea of Galilee is actually a freshwater lake. It's not seawater or salt water at all. It sets at 600 feet below sea level, making it the lowest lake in the world. It's about 14 miles long, about 7 miles wide. It's shaped like a harp, and it should have taken the disciples about three hours to sail or row across the lake. So Jesus and his disciples started out on a three-hour tour. 
The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless Lord, the disciples would be lost. Now, folks, if you don't get that, you miss one of the great TV shows in American history, right? Take your Bibles today and go with me to Mark chapter 4. Let's go ahead and stand together as we read God's Word today. Um, I cannot wait for the reaction in the second service as I give them a little Gilligan's Island. It's going to be really fun to see if anybody gets it. But Mark chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 35 through verse 41. Thank you for standing in honor of, of the reading of God's word today. Let's read this story of Jesus calming the storm. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet. Or hush, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Today, my prayer for us throughout the week has been that we will recognize that we can faith the storms of life if we have Jesus Christ with us. God bless you, church family. Be seated. Now, as we begin this morning, I want to introduce to you one of my favorite paintings. It is a painting done by the Dutch master Rembrandt van Rijn. It was painted in 1632. Let's go ahead and get it on the screen. Uh, This painting that you see before you today was displayed for many years in an art museum in Boston until it was stolen back in the year 1990. Now let me just say this to you. If you see this painting laying around or hanging around at some garage sale, call the FBI because there's a $5 million reward for the finding of this painting. Now, this painting is so interesting because... If you were able to see it more closely, and I want you to go look it up, it's called A Storm on the Sea of Galilee by Rembrandt Van Ryn. Uh, when, if you were to look at it more closely, you would see that there are 13 disciples in the boat. Now, why are there 13 disciples? Because Rembrandt painted himself into the scene. Now, the, the reason I want to bring this painting to mind is because this painting reveals to us a lot about this sermon. You see, the painting shows that there were some disciples who were fighting against the storm. Uh, Their focus was on the storm. And then the painting also shows there were disciples who were gathered around Jesus. You see, their focus was not on the storm, but on the Savior. And the painting begs the question today, when you face the storms of your life, And we're all going to face storms. We've all faced storms. When you face the storms of your life, do you fearfully focus on the storm or do you faithfully focus on Jesus? Today, there are five lessons that I want to bring to mind as we talk about faithing the storms of our lives. And here's the very first lesson today, and we all need to remember this, that you can be close to Jesus and still encounter storms. You see, Jesus knew when he said, let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, that they were going to encounter a storm. And sometimes people who know and love the Lord think that we ought to be exempt from the stormy experiences of life. As a pastor, I've heard people actually say this. Pastor, I don't understand that I came to know Christ and I still face these issues. You see, some make the mistake of thinking that just because they have the Lord in their life now, that they're going to be immune to trouble, that they're going to be immune to tribulation, immune to problems. But we have to recognize and remember that even though Jesus is in this boat, that the storm still struck. You see, the same is true for us. Physical storms, 
financial storms, relational storms, marital storms, emotional storms, they strike us seemingly with no warning. And if you're facing a storm, and many of you would say today, I am facing a storm. Let me say this. You shouldn't be surprised. It shouldn't come as a shock to you. The Bible says this, dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. If you suffer as a Christian, the text says, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. Storms come at us wave after wave after wave. It reminds me of a guy on a ranch. I don't know if you've heard the story. He was being chased by a bull. And he saw this hole in the ground, and it was the only way out, so he jumped into the hole. Well, the bull ran by, and then the guy jumped back up out of the hole. The bull turns around and comes at him again. The guy jumps back into the hole. The bull passes, he jumps back out. And this happened over and over and over, repeated for several cycles. And somebody was watching this whole charade, and he says, Man, why don't you just stay down in the hole? And the guy says, Hey, there's a rattlesnake in the hole. Right? And that's kind of the way life feels. It's not really all that far-fetched. We jump out of one problem into another. Life can be tough. Christians aren't immune. All of us encounter storms. The first lesson, I think, in this passage is you can be close to Jesus Christ and still experience storms. How many of you have found that to be true? Let me give you the second lesson. The second lesson in this story is Jesus permits storms to test our faith. You see, as soon as the disciples awoke Jesus, he immediately asked them two questions. Did you see the questions? Why are you so afraid? And do you still have no faith? And if you read between the lines, it's not hard to see that Jesus was giving them a test. Will they trust him during the storm? And I submit to you today that God still does this. God absolutely still does this. He tests our faith during the difficult times of life when living is hard. Let's talk about three ways that God tests our faith. I want you to write these down for yourselves today because this is exactly the way God does it, at least three of the ways. The first I'm going to call the pressure test. Now, now this faith test has these questions. How will you handle stress when you're at your absolute limit? How do you react when you get to the POTD? You know what that means? The point of total desperation. How will you react when you get to the POTD? Like a pressure cooker building up heat and pressure, will you explode in anger? Will you keep the lid on and trust God until the heat finally dies down? That's the pressure test. How are you going to respond when you're at your absolute limit? The second way I think that God tests our faith is this, the people test. Now, we know this one well. This one makes sense, right? Sometimes God puts people in our life that will stretch our faith. Uh, These are the people that rub you the wrong way. They find that one nerve that you've got left exposed and they grind all over it, right? They're, They're hard for you to love. But hey, you admit that Jesus loves them too. So how do you handle that test? Do you strike out at them or do you patiently love them? The pressure test, the people test. The third one is the persistence test. Now, now this test asks the question, will I, main my, will I maintain my commitments or will I just quit? You see, I think in every endeavor of life, especially in our spiritual endeavors, especially in the church, I find, there will always be a time that you just want to give up. And a weak person gives up too soon. But a wise person persists to the end of every commitment, and God rewards those who persist and pass the perseverance or the persistence test. And so we have three tests, right? The lesson is this, that Jesus permits storms to test our faith, and he tests us with the pressure test, the people test, the persistence test. Let me give you the third lesson in this passage. The third one is this, that storms force us to cry out to Jesus. Several of these disciples, we know this, right? They were fishermen. 
What's that tell us about them? They had spent a lot of time on the Sea of Galilee. These guys were boatsmen, if you will. They understood what it was like to maintain a boat. So here's what I know. I know they tried everything humanly possible to battle this storm. They trimmed the sails. They pointed the bow of that boat into the wind. They bailed water. They did all the things that they knew to do, but it soon became apparent that their resources weren't enough. So it was then in their weakness, right, that they cried out to Jesus. And when they woke Jesus, they asked him the most interesting of questions. What'd they say? Don't you care if we drown? Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that just like a human being, right? When we're in a storm, our mind rushes to the worst case scenario. They didn't say, Jesus, did you know there's a storm? They actually go all the way, right? Don't you care if we drown? Worst case scenario. And I think we do the same things. Don't you care that I'm going through this rough time? And we might even trump it up a bit. Don't you care that I'm about to die here? We say that. Don't you care? Have you ever asked God that probing question? God, don't you care? I find a lot of people walk away from Jesus because they have lost the perception and and, and, and entered into their mind this false perception that Jesus simply doesn't care, that God doesn't care. But I stand here today to remind all of you in this room, those of you watching online, listen to me. God does care. The book of 1 Peter tells us so clearly in chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your cares upon the Lord. Cast all your anxiety upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you. You see, today you may be going through one of these desperate moments. And you're at the POTD, the point of total desperation, right? You may be wondering, what should I do? And my advice to you is very simple. In this storm that you're facing, cry out to Jesus Christ. You know, one of my favorite songs, and 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 it's hovered and been around for a while, but I always find myself coming back to it. It's a great song by Third Day titled, Cry Out to Jesus. And if you don't know the song, you ought to go look it up and listen to it. I'm just going to share some of the lyrics. It says, to everyone who's lost someone they love long before it was their time. You feel like the days you had were not enough when you said goodbye. And to all the people with burdens and pain keeping you back from your life. You believe that there's nothing and there's no one who can make it right. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. There's grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. It says, cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. Folks, storms, it's a lesson in this story. Storms will force you to cry out to Jesus Christ. Let me give you the fourth lesson. The fourth lesson is interesting. It's Jesus will either calm your storm or... He'll calm you in the middle of it. Jesus will either calm your storm or he will actually calm you. And I love the fact that Jesus is snoozing during the storm. And it's one of the most interesting things of this story. It it tells me, first of all, that Jesus was a human like me. He got tired. He needed a little bit of rest. He needed to take a little nap as he crossed over the lake. But the second thing, it shows me that Jesus had a strong sense of tranquility that allowed him to sleep even through his storms. You see, there were two storms present on this night. I'm not sure if you've thought about it. There was the weather storm, the wind and the waves that were about to swamp the boat. But second, there was also a storm in the hearts of those disciples. And here's what we learn in this, that fear can be more destructive than even a hurricane. Fear can do even more damage than the storms that surround us. Let me tell you a story that Paul Harvey told years ago. It was about a chicken farmer in the state of Tennessee who suspected that an old fox was raiding his hen house at night. He was losing eggs, he was losing hens, and so one night he had had enough, so he put a loaded shotgun right next to his bed. 
Well, he heard this ruckus out in the hen house, right? So he slipped outside in the middle of the night, couldn't see a single thing. And as he approached that dark hen house, fear began to set in. He began to wonder, what if the fox attacks me, right? What if it's not even a fox? What if it's a bobcat? What if it's a cougar? And as he stood there at the doorway to the hen house, these thoughts of fear were swirling through his mind. He was finding himself getting more and more afraid. And it was at that precise moment that his faithful hound dog, Blue, crept up behind him and cold-nosed him under his nightshirt. Well, immediately upon doing that, kablam! He fires off the shotgun. Nine hens lost their lives that night. And Paul Harvey used to say, it wasn't the shotgun that killed them, it was what? Fear. (laughs) So Jesus asked the question, why are you afraid? And he spoke to the wind and the waves. And you heard me change the language earlier when I read the text. He said, hush, be still. That's literally the word used in the Greek text. It's the same phrase that a kind mother will say to their crying child, Hush, little baby, right? Settle down. And the Bible says in that moment, and this is the miracle, correct? In that moment, it was completely calm. There was great calm. The word in your text, it uses the word mega. There was mega calm. Now that's amazing, isn't it? From wind and waves about to swamp the boat, the disciples doing everything they could in their understanding of the sea and the water, crying out to Jesus, begging him for care in the midst of this moment that might make them drown, and then the storm's gone. Hush. Jesus took the storm away. Jesus can do that for you, too. Sometimes he takes the storms away. But not always, right? You see, there's another side of that coin. Sometimes he doesn't remove the storm. He just speaks to our troubled hearts, and to us, he says, hush, be still. And in our hearts, what's he bring us? Mega calm. Peace that passes understanding. And some of you today have been asking God to take this storm away. And he hasn't done it yet. But you know what? He's ready to offer you peace that only he can give in the midst of your storm. The final lesson today is the most powerful one to me. The fourth lesson, Jesus will either calm your storm or calm you. The fifth lesson is if Jesus is in your boat, you know you're going to make it through this storm. Now this week, all of us, I would assume, have had our eye on the state of Florida and all that's transpired there with Hurricane Ian. But I'm going to submit to you today something you won't expect me to say. The strongest hurricane in history could not have sunk the boat that Jesus Christ was on on the Sea of Galilee. All of of Caesar's armies and navies could not have brought it down. The devil himself could not have sunk it. Why? Because Jesus had declared at the beginning of our passage that he was going to sail to the other side and nothing, friend, was going to stop that. And here's why I get so excited, because in the same way, Jesus has also promised his followers that we will make it through every storm. He didn't say that we would have a storm-proof life. He just promised to be with us in the midst of that storm. He guarantees us that we're going to make it. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather be in a storm with Jesus than outside a storm without Jesus. Amen? You see, Jesus never promises us a smooth ride but he guarantees us a definite destination. If you know Jesus Christ, friend, you're going to make it through. That fifth fifth lesson is powerful 
So now let's, let's carry it to the end. The greatest maritime disaster in all of history, we know this, the sinking of the Titanic on April the 15th, 1912. And all of those who knew about such things said it was the unsinkable ship. And, and, and yet, even though they said that, that's all she really ever did was sink, right? History tells us that the crew members actually said out loud to the passengers getting on that day, God himself cannot even sink this ship. That's a true story. It was a tragic story, though. And the most tragic of all the stories was there was not enough lifeboats and over 1,500 people perished. But there's a part of this story I want to share with you today that maybe you've never heard. The Titanic was built in Belfast, Ireland, Northern Ireland. And after the news broke about the tragic sinking of the great and mighty Titanic, all the people of Belfast took to the streets to weep and mourn. The ship sank on a Monday and that following Sunday in the Derry Presbyterian Church. There was great sadness because 16 men who were members of that church worked and sailed on the Titanic as engineers, and they drowned in the icy waters of the North Atlantic, all 16. And the church was packed that Sunday. The pastor's name was Andrew Smith. Pastor Smith stood up in the pulpit that day to preach on the exact text that you and I studied this morning. The very same story. And history says at the end of the message... He made these statements to his grieving congregation. He said, friends, there was only one vessel in all of history that was truly unsinkable, that little boat occupied by the sleeping Savior. And then he added, and the only hearts that can weather the storms of life are the hearts that have Jesus inside. Did you notice the last things the disciples asked? Did you see the little tag on the end of this story? They said, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now that's a pretty important question for you to answer for yourself. Who is this man? Who is Jesus? Well, to close out, let me tell you. He's Jesus, God's Son, and you can trust Him. I wish I could more accurately describe Him to you, but He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't outlive Him, and you can't live without Him. The Pharisees couldn't stand Him, but they certainly couldn't stop Him. Pilate couldn't fault Him. Herod couldn't kill Him. Death couldn't conquer Him, and the grave couldn't hold Him. My friends, He's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the God God of the future and he's the God of the past and there's no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. Friends, his name is Jesus Christ. So only with Jesus can you faith your storms. Give your life to Jesus. Let's pray together. Dearest Lord Jesus, we've started this service by singing about how you save us. We've sung over and over about how our weakness can be made strong in you. And we hear what the Bible says today, that there is no other name by which a person can be saved from sin apart from you. It's not about churchiness. It's not about religion. It's about the fact that without you, we're going to sink and drown and die for all eternity. Our sin is going to remove us from you. We don't have a choice. We're in a mess. But Jesus, thank you that you left the glory of heaven, that you came as the Son of God, and you gave yourself so that we might be saved. So God, today I pray if there's anyone who doesn't know you as Savior, that today they would say, you know, I need this Jesus. 
And I want this Jesus. And I, and I turn away from my old life and I receive the new life that only Jesus can offer me. God, save somebody today eternally. Bring them by faith to you. Let them be saved by your powerful love and grace. And then God kind of rolling into our real life situation here. There's people in this room that they are they're in desperate storms. It's way too much for them. Their boat's getting swamped. And I pray that they wouldn't try to do what they know to do to try to keep it afloat, but they would just say, Jesus, I'm going to put my focus on you, not the storm, but on the Savior. And I'm going to let you carry me and guide me and captain me through this thing. Lord, teach us all to faith our storms and to trust in you and you alone. Lord, that's our prayer in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, church family. What's God said to you today? He said a lot. Some of you may be here and you say, you know what? I'm the person who needs to be saved from my sin. I've danced on the edge of this for a long time. But I need Jesus. And I'm going to ask you to receive him this morning. I'm going to ask you to step out and come down front and take me as the pastor by the hand. Nothing ritualistic about that, but I just want you to come and say, I want Christ to be my Savior. And I'm going to pray with you. And we're going to together ask Christ to come into your heart and life. And that prayer prayed in faith, Jesus says, when you claim him to be Savior and Lord, he will save your soul. Would you do that today? Maybe you're here and you're a believer. You're already a Christian. You've already prayed that prayer. You've already followed the Lord. Would you come and say, I'm rededicating my life because this is the captain I want to connect my life even more to. And maybe you've taken your eyes off of what you should and you need to put them back on Christ today in the middle of your life, your storm. Uh, maybe you're here and you say, I need a church home. We all need a church home. We need people in this boat with us, right? And so maybe today God's saying, hey, join First Baptist Church. We want to invite you to come. This altar is available for you. Grab somebody by the hand and say, come pray with me over this issue. Whatever it is, you come. As Ed leads us, you come. You come. Savior, I come to you.
Church family, I, I want to invite you to pray for this young man who has come this morning. His name is Xavier Anderson, and I met Xavier for the first time uh, when we came into church, and he has just shared with me, he wanted me to ask you this. He said that this sermon was for him. He knows it completely. He's in a storm of life, and he knows um, that God brought him here so that the Lord could speak to him. And he wanted me to ask you, and I want to ask you if you would pray for him. Xavier Anderson, all right? And Xavier, we, we care for you. Uh, we care for you, young man, and we're glad that you're here. And this church, I promise you, when all this is said and done and we say we're out of here, there's going to be a lot of people come over there and shake your hand and hug your neck, and you're going to realize you have a family around you already, okay? We appreciate that. Um, go ahead and be seated, church family. Let's turn our attention to our screens for this week's announcements. Good morning, everyone. This is Kathy with your announcements for the week. Um, I want to let everyone know that we're having our first steps luncheon today after the service in the fellowship hall. So this is for those who just joined the church or if you um, want to know a little bit more about uh, First Baptist and about, about us and what's going on, uh, please join us in the fellowship hall right after the service. Um, just know that we are going to be having our emphasis on Mary Hill Davis this month. Um, that's an offering for um, advancing mission efforts in the state of Texas. And so if you feel led, please um, give to that uh, wonderful um, offering. Um, we are also having a fellowship out at Lake Halbert on October 9th. We are going to be having baptisms. We're going to be having homemade ice cream. So that's going to be at 6 o'clock next week um, out at Lake Halpert. And I know that there are some people in this church who do not like to decorate for Christmas before Thanksgiving. But I say November 1st, go for it. It is a good idea, and I'm all for it. But before you put up those stockings, just remember, we are going to have Light the Night on October 30th. So that is a great event. We invite the entire community to, um, and we need lots of people to uh, put that event on, from donating to candy to decorating a truck for the kids to set up and break down. So if you'd like to be a part of that, we need lots of help. Come sign out, um, sign up on the landing outside the sanctuary doors, um, and we'd be so excited to have you help us out with that. And last, I want to let you know that there are going to be no um, church services tonight, um, so you can spend time with your family, or if you want to just sit around and think about what you're going to decorate your trunk with or how you're going to decorate it, that's fine too, however you want to spend your time tonight. So, um, but whatever you do, um, we are excited to see you here today, and we look forward to seeing you here next week. Have a great week. Good job, Kathy Byrne. You know, yeah, okay, all right, all right. You know, some, some staff members think just because they get to do this little video that they can make digs at their pastor for not decorating for Christmas till after Thanksgiving is over. Um, but Kathy, I've got the mic now, okay? <laughs> And that's the last time you get to do the announcement. No, I'm kidding. No, Kathy's one of these people that decorates for Christmas on July the 1st. And so that makes, that makes no sense to me. Um, hey, very exciting. Second service, 22 kids um, are going to be here to receive their first ever Bible given by the church. We're so excited about that. And um, be praying for those families. They're just going to be packed all over the front of the sanctuary. We're excited about that. And then listen to this. Our new member orientation class, that first steps, we have 100 people signed up to come to that class. Um, people 
that have joined the church or are interested in being a part of our family. And so we're praying for that effort as well. It's a big day, lots of stuff going on. And don't forget, start making ice cream. Get ready for next Sunday night. Homemade ice cream, Bluebell is not homemade ice cream, okay? Even though the commercial says that. Truly homemade ice cream and four people getting baptized. It's going to be a great night. Let's stand together, church. God bless you. Thanks for being here with us. I'm prepared for a great morning in Bible study as you leave. Let's sing our closing song. All right, let's sing our way out. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts toward heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Amen. Have a great rest of your day.